Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wall Street for Main Street Podcast. My name is Mo Daoud, and today's guest is Charles Ortel. Uh, Charles is a returning guest. Charles is a money manager, investor, and writer. He's known for covering the GM bankruptcy, the recent investigation he did on the Clinton Foundation, and he also predicted the 2008 financial crisis when no one was listening. Charles, thank you for coming back. It's my pleasure, Mo. How are you doing? Uh, good. So I wanted to uh, talk about recent current events that happened um, in the economy and the stock market. Uh, first, I want to talk about what's going on in the U.S. stock market. Uh, we're seeing a lot of volatility in the stock market in the past few weeks. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts, and this is, is this a sign of things to come? Because this happened right after the volatility that happened in the Chinese stock market starting in July. Yeah, I think what we're seeing, Mo, is, is that uh, people are finally beginning to understand that right around January 2009, the U.S. market, indeed the global markets, entered purgatory. We were neither in hell nor in heaven as central banks made a coordinated decision not only to suppress interest rates, reference interest rates for risk-free paper around the world, uh, but even to start you know, influencing markets either by buying futures or by, in, by in some cases buying uh, individual names, baskets of names, and then in addition, governments uh, around the world continue their practice of recklessly spending far more than they take it in the way of tax revenue and not even doing it for sensible purposes, uh, doing it for purposes that in the main have pushed up the cost of government, pushed up the cost of production in the developed world. So people you know, are sort of sick and tired of hope and change and slogans and, and then looking at the numbers that come in for the actively traded names and seeing – uh, in uh, revenue, year-on-year year revenue that is falling when you adjust for, you know, one-off things and acquisitions and stuff like that, and seeing profit margins sh- shrinking when you take out the funny business reorganization uh, charges and benefits, and then seeing free cash flow margins. That is, you know, the, for the average Joe, uh, people understand that you, know, you, you make $100,000 what matters is how much you keep of that after taxes and expenses. So that how much you keep is the so-called free cash flow, and free cash flow is shrinking. So the only thing that's keeping these stock prices up is the expectation that central banks can keep interest rates low. Uh, and when interest rates are low, what that does is that forces people chasing yield into the stock market, and it creates an arbitrary, unrealistic floor for the valuation of securities. Yeah, and there's no question that the Federal Reserve and central bank all around the world are propping up the stock market in their own protect, uh, perfected countries like China. They're do, trying to do it really hard right now. They're, going, they're taking out all the measures to try to prop up the stock market from uh, banning short selling to try to literally give money to uh, the uh, hedge funds and equity companies to try to prop up the market. And yet there's still a lot of volatility in the Chinese market. And if you look at this chart for the U.S. stock market, I'm looking at the Dow Jones. I mean, I, I give the credit for Federal Reserve. I did a nice job popping up the stock market, but eventually the, the bubble has to burst. Of course. I mean, you know, if we think about it, uh, I think the statistic is that in China, fewer than 10% of all the people in China have any money in the market. In the U.S., um, I think the figure is about the same if you if you just are thinking about people who buy individual stocks. I think the bottom 80% of Americans buy income, household income, have nothing in the stock market, have no financial assets of any kind. The, the residual, the 20, 20% remaining, uh, you have to have a portfolio approaching 250, maybe $500,000 to, to responsibly think about buying individual stocks. And so it's a very small universe of people in the U.S. and around the world who cares about the absolute values and, and the daily movements in the Dow Jones or individual stocks. And so what this ill-advised policy of, of the central bank and of the governments of, of con- prolonging the agony, deferring the surgery that's required to bring the cost structure in the developed world down in line so that it can be competitive with the emerging world, uh, to take the excess capacity that is all over parts of America and throughout Europe and Japan, take that excess capacity out. Instead of doing that, we are keeping that excess capacity. We're spending more to paint the excess capacity, to pretend that it shouldn't be taken out of the system. 
and we're just making ourselves ever more uh, uncompetitive. At the same time, we're allowing the Obama administration and, and those who support in the Republican and Democrat parties this idea that you know a bigger government's a better government. We're allowing government to strangle us, which is like we're committing assisted suicide gleefully here, piling on more debt, deferring the day of reckoning, and thinking that the laws of supply and demand can be suspended forever because they won't be. Yeah, we're seeing the middle class in this country getting crushed through either through inflation, high regulation, and taxation. And we're seeing a, the great wealth effect where all the money is uh, going from middle class to uh, the upper class. And that's why we're seeing a, a gap in the income inequality as well. A lot of that can be contributed to the inflation and, and taxation um, as well. Well, it's even worse than that, Mo. I mean, I think what's going on here is it can – to, if you study American history and American economic history, it's akin to what happened in the 20s and 30s when uh, it suddenly became uh, less expensive to mechanize farms and it suddenly became uh, more prevalent to, instead of using horses, you would start using you know more and more passenger vehicles and trucks and stuff like that. And so you had a situation in the U.S. where a, a high percentage, much higher than is currently the case, of the American workforce was on the farm, even as late as in the 20s. And suddenly, there was it didn't make sense to employ people on the farm. You didn't need as many people doing that work. The same thing is going on across the American economy. And believe it or not, it started in the financial services business in scale, where you know today you have so much of the trading done by machines that used to be done by physical people. Um, this trend, experts say, and you read about it all over the place from magazines to scholarly articles, is going to only accelerate. So uh, human labor is under siege, particularly in countries like the United States, where it's highly paid on world scale, particularly in Europe, particularly in Japan. And our politicians are sitting there talking smack about how uh, you know the businesses are, are not responsible because they're not creating new New jobs. Why should you employ a highly paid person today when you can when you can uh, get a machine on board? Uh, in many industries, from the most the simplest, you know, fast food restaurants are reinventing themselves. Wall Street's reinventing itself. High tech industry hasn't really added that many jobs when you go back to 1998, 99, and look at whatever figures passed for full time equivalent uh, workers in this country. And the one place that has piled on a ton of jobs is, uh, and they're unproductive jobs, is the government and the industries that that are quasi-government that hide in the private sector figures but really are not true private sector jobs. So we need some creativity here, and we could turn this around, but not by taking the same old playbook. And on the question of, you know, the middle class, frankly, there is no middle class in the United States. There hasn't been one for a long time. And, and instead what we have is we have people who have protected jobs, either unionized protected jobs in the private sector or worse, unionized uh, civil service protected jobs in the public sector, in the quasi-public sector. Those people are not as subject to the great pressures, job replacement, international pressures and the like, uh, for the moment. And, you know, we're not getting thoughtful analysis in, in this campaign season about how to change this. And the fact that the uh, politicians uh, in the United States are looking to increase minimum uh, wage does not help uh, the unemployment uh, situation either. Uh, if you look at what's going on in Seattle, they're raised their minimum wage of $15, and they're already starting to see the bad consequences of doing that because a lot of uh, – Small business and local restaurant are closing uh, down because I mean the labor cost for restaurant is high, and I don't think the politician did the basic math on this that when you continue to increase uh, labor cost and yet their profit margin for restaurant is it, pretty thin um, across the board. So any increase in labor cost, it doesn't make any sense to keep, uh, keep the shop open. So we're seeing a close down in Seattle and eventually in LA, and uh, and we're also starting to see corporations like McDonald's talking about replacing their workers with uh, machines. Of course. I I mean, if you want to go out and you want to drive a car in this country, you've got to pass 
a simple exam. It's actually not that t- not as tough as the exams that are, are in place in Europe and in Japan. But you've got to actually pass that exam. And if you and if you're driving a car, you should have insurance. Uh, and if you own a car, you have to have insurance. Politicians should be forced. Anybody who's in a position to exercise influence over the economy should be forced to pass a an arithmetic test. And I bet you 50% of them couldn't pass that simple eighth grade arithmetic not complex stuff and and then next uh, they need to understand how businesses actually operate how they operate in the united states versus the global competition who is the global competition why are they winning against american business they need to understand all this stuff the notion that you are going to do anything good by raising minimum wage is brain damage minimum wage is not something is not a wage that was set up so that people can live on it and support a family. Minimum wage was was set up years ago, decades ago, to be less than the prevailing wage rate, to encourage people, or students starting out in life, to test their get their their fingers wet uh, in the in the economy. Actually working it was meant to be lower than a you know a prevailing wage. As you raise that wage, what you're doing is you're making it ever more difficult for people to get a start in the economy. It's craziness. And yeah, I remember when I, in the early 90s when I go to McDonald's, Burger King, it's mostly young students right. there, a college students working there. Right. And, and, and then you couple that with this, this issue of not having a border. Um, you know, I love the canard that the politicians like to throw around saying, you know, that the people doing the low-wage jobs are doing it because Americans won't do it. That is just utter rubbish. In the main, and the, the, the people, what's going on is that businesses are, are taking advantage of illegal immigrants who have no other alternative. They're paying them in cash off the books more than they would make if they paid them on the books, and hiding that in the way they run their businesses. And that if you go around, uh, you know, the heartland of America, anywhere there's a farm, anywhere there's construction activity, you will see these people, and nobody is checking to see how much they actually get paid, whether Social Security is taken out of their pay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the, the solutions that these people are coming up with, I mean, it, I suppose it's not surprising if you think about Congress. I mean, it has a very low approval rating, both parties. They hardly do any work. They're on vacation again now. They never read anything before they pass the bills. And they're never held accountable. I mean, they, if, once you're elected as a congressman, it's very a person is very tough to lose your seat. You know, this has all got to change. Yeah, Congress is one big party, and if it's not in it, then you, you won't get any, any of the benefit. Right. Uh, so I want to uh, check gears here and talk about uh, the oil prices and in relation to the petrodollar system. Um, now, with the crude prices under $50, uh, do you believe the pet- uh, petrodollar system is under imminent threat as you know Saudi Arabia continues to draw down their uh, U.S. Treasury bond reserve to make up for the deficit? Uh, absolutely. You know, this is what I, uh, I've been arguing for some time. I think the last time I was on with your colleague Jason, I mean, the, we face now a series of structural uh, stress fractures. They're going to get resolved in ways that could be highly detrimental to to everyone in America, everyone in the advanced world. Um, you, you look there and you say, you know, if you're if you're sitting there and you're trying to uh, protect the wealth that you have and you're American, you care about the dollar. Are you seriously going to hold on to two and a quarter, let's say, percent yielding ten year debt, and and be happy about paying tax? Uh, federal tax on the interest, uh, um, and and then suffering whatever damage you suffer should there be inflation or diminution in the purchasing power of your principal when you get it back ten years from now. It's just it's silliness that you know that we would be in in this place. And around the world, people understand that. You know, uh, the, China is being very clever. I mean, they, I think they're in serious trouble, serious internal troubles. I think they have demographic problems, they have a massive debt problem, they have internal or disclosure problems, but by telegraphing weakness, um, what, what happened was that it put a bid under treasuries and that gave them cover to sell out a big percentage of their holdings. 
and they're going to continue to do that. I think they're doing that in Germany. I think governments around the world are starting uh, wherever they can in size to get out of treasuries, to get out of European debt, and soon to get out of Japanese debt. Um, and you know, as bad as our problems are, Japan's are even worse. So you have that. Then you have across the Middle East these insane policies. I mean, we can not just beat up on Obama and Clinton and, and Kerry, but go all the way back to George W. Bush, um, and even before that, perhaps to Carter, and say, you know, we had a system in place at one point. You know, the Shah was our ally. Uh, we also simultaneously, so we had a basically a, a, the largest Shiite country. Um, and at that time, uh, Iran was really a secular, more of a secular state. Uh, but we had the largest country in the region with a massive Shiite population bedded down, and we had excellent relations with Saudi Arabia. And then Jimmy Carter decided to to do what he did and and proceed afterwards to lecture the world about you know all the other missteps that in his eyes have been ha- happened ever since 1979 when he really threw a monkey wrench into the Middle East. Then by the time we get to uh, George W. Um, I don't think he had any choice in going into Iraq, but I think they made big mistakes not sending in enough force, overwhelming force, in Afghanistan and in Iraq to win the job quickly and leave the enemy defeated and demoralized and in a place to understand that it's not about bombs, it's not about killing people, it's about a way of life. It does not make sense to return to pre-medieval times and treat women and, and people who exercise their own judgment and decide to worship or not to worship in a certain way, it just doesn't make sense to throw out all the learning over centuries, all the advancement in thinking that has occurred around the world and retreat into such a repressive, negative, cruel, uh, really anti-humane le- level of existence. We could have won that battle between 1993 and and really 2000 let's say 5 we could have won that battle instead we what we, we didn't and then starting in 2008-9 president obama and and clinton and kerry have gone hog wild crazy and uh now you see in saudi arabia i wrote about this a couple of years ago and i've been writing about it since saudi arabia is incredibly vulnerable we could wake up uh tomorrow morning and learn that iran had been successful um, stirring up the uh, Shiite population, which is a significant percentage in the eastern region of Saudi Arabia where all the oil is, uh, toppling the Saudi regime. It's a very unstable situation. Bahrain is unstable. Uh, the, the Iran basically already more or less controls Iraq and, of course, Iran. Um, so, you know, they can make quite a clean, clean sweep through the Middle East rapidly. Uh, do so perhaps in league with Russia, and we would wake up in a situation where our the, the European banking system would be in terrible shape. Our own economy is is flatlining, redlining, um, and the rest of the world looks at the United States and knows that we have a protracted period here through January 2017, where no one really is going to be in charge in America. It's very dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, and in, in, in Saudi Arabia, they're, they're trying to uh, wipe out the uh, Shia population, and while in Iran, they're trying to uh, wipe out the Sunni population. So it's just Muslims trying to kill each other, unfortunately. But I don't think I want to see the U.S. government step foot in the Middle East and start another war, because every time they step foot in the Middle East, they tend to make things worse. If you look at what's going on in Syria and Iraq, uh, it's worse than what it was before uh, they took over. Uh, back in early 2000. So, um, but going back to talk, talking about the crude prices, a lot of these uh, oil countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran need oil prices to be at least uh, triple digit so they can fund their social program. And what we're seeing, now even Russia need high oil prices to fund their social program. So what we're going to be interesting to see what happened down the road and how long the Oil prices can stay under fifty because a lot of oil companies cannot profit under fifty dollars. Right. Well, I, I would say I'd do a, put maybe a little finer point on it. I would say that the the potentate, you know, the kingdoms throughout the Middle East, Saudi Arabia in particular, have very serious problems because 
the, the rich are such as the truly rich connected to the oil money, connected to the royal families, are such a small percentage of the total. They live so lavishly. Um, and and the population in Saudi Arabia has been growing quite rapidly. So you're absolutely right that in Saudi Arabia and some of these other places, with oil where it is, um, you know, uh, it is it, it, they are running through their resources very quickly. In the case of Russia, now they, they have different issues, but in the case of Russia, uh, their external debt is not really that high, and their population actually is a lot lower than it used to be. So, uh, and they have this massive territory. Um, so they're, you know, they, they can't continue to do what they've been doing forever. But I would say they are less in trouble than a Saudi Arabia which cannot defend itself without foreign intervention, than yeah. a Kuwait that can't do it, or Bahrain that can't do it, a Qatar, et cetera. So, um, you know, the world is certainly on its head from August of 2008 when oil prices were strong. You know, up in the 125, 140 area, um, it's certainly on its head. Uh, I mean, I, I look at uh, I look at the oil price trend, commodity price trend. Commodity prices are red across the board, pretty much, except you know, excluding precious metals, which are down. But still, basic commodities are are, are down. Shipping trends are down. Um, <clears throat> so, electricity usage is down. Uh, the one thing that's high, debt. Around the world, debt is stratospherically high. And then <clears throat> the thing that's different in 2015 from 2008 is that it's much easier if you're a, a, a business owner to replace an expensive worker with a machine. Much easier. Yeah, what we're seeing uh, Foxconn, which uh, manufactured for Apple, they're trying to replace their workers with machines. Uh, the wages in China had increased in double digit in the past few years. I, I, I understand completely, and you're going to see it here too, you know. And and, and so, I, I, another thing I would say for those of us who enjoy, you know, studying finance and stuff like that, I think what we're lo- going to learn shortly, sadly, is the notion that you can diversify in this world in this moment is absolutely false. That you know everything has become not because of the internet, but because of the central bank inter- intervention. Uh, because of the fact that we have so much debt, because of the fact that herds are following each other around the world, we're in this place where you think you're diversified, but you're not. I mean, you look at a GE as an example, a company I've followed for a while. Uh, everyone would hold that out as a diversified pile of, of, of businesses. But is it? I mean, it doesn't really give you in its filings uh, or you know, in its supplemental analyst disclosures, it doesn't really tell you precisely where it's making its money, where it's sending its goods and services. They may make them here, send them elsewhere, and vice versa. So you don't really know who your ultimate risk is in GE in terms of, you know, what, what growth trends are you hostage to. You, you don't really understand your costs there. You don't understand. They don't give you enough geographic information. <clears throat> so that's a, that's a hodgepodge. And what I found over time, the GE's results, as an example, correlate very closely with oil prices. When oil price is high and rising, its customers, um, you know, for infrastructure projects are prone to use them expansively across its full platform. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, airplane engine customers are going to replace, when oil prices are high, they'll be more prone to replace fleets with these, you know, better, uh, more efficient engines, uh, and turbines and the like. So in a high oil price period, they do well. In declining oil price periods, they're not, they don't do so well. And now they're in the middle of a leveraged liquidation, uh, which is never, I, I like to call it a leveraged decapitation, never really works that well to do something like that when you've got a lot of debt to begin with and you've got a thin capital structure. So, uh, you know, companies that you think are diversified are not. Uh, when you put together a, quote, portfolio, is that 16, is that 25, is that 40 positions, who really knows enough to know when you know when uh, Germany sneezes, is America catching a cold? Uh, you know, we we just don't. We're not doing our homework properly, and I fear what we're gonna what's gonna happen is, around the world, everybody's assuming that one or more central banker leader has the brilliant idea that's going to get us out of this mess. We've been at this, as I say, since January 2009, and really, investors since ever since I would argue. 
2007 have not been fairly compensated for taking uh, any kind of risk, whether it's government bond or up the risk curve into uh, public uh, securities and then into private securities. You just haven't been compensated for taking the risk. And when the music stops and we wake up uh, and suddenly, you know, for whatever reason, it's out of our control, we've got to pay down the global debt, um, it's going to be ugly. And that's a great point. Now, one last subject before I let you go. I want to talk about the Clinton Foundation. Now, you did a six-month investigation on the Clinton Foundation, which is a place where the Clintons store away all their tax-free wealth from doing all the dirty deals with the cronies and foreign government. So I want to talk about what did you find in your investigation, and is there anything there that surprised you? Yeah, it's, thanks for asking, Mo. Uh, what happened was um, I'm in the middle of setting up a new business, catering to people who have wealth and want to preserve it, catering to people who care about philanthropy, like to give wisely, and people who extol patriotism, like American history, and believe this country stands for something great. So I know a lot about, I think I know somewhat, I should say, about uh, preserving wealth, and I know a fair bit about uh, our history, and uh, you know, I'm an amateur student of, of history. But the one area I hadn't studied as closely as I needed to was, you know, how do you tell off of public available data whether a charity is doing good or bad work? And as it turns out, I would, uh, and so I turned to, uh, I decided I'd study the Clinton Foundation just because it's so actively covered. Uh, I assumed, I don't like the Clintons, I'll be right up front, I don't like their politics, I don't like what they've done over a long period of, in quotes, public service. But I was, <clears throat> I sort of expected a Rhodes Scholar and the smartest woman in the world would get together a team to run a foundation in the name of themselves and their daughter that would actually comply with the rules. And instead what I found, and I've gotten quite an education uh, reading myself and then working with some experts, accounting, legal, other experts, uh, when you when you run a, a what's called a 501c3, a public charity, um, there's special rules. And the first one is that uh, a public charity stands in the shoes of government. It, by definition, cannot do anything illegal. And unlike a corporation or an investment fund or whatever, the trustees of a 501c3 are in fact responsible, bright line responsible for the entire operation of the charity. They can't hide behind the manager or an accounting firm or experts. They're on the line. And uh, so in the first instance, you can't lie on your filings. You can't make error-ridden late filings, which is something they have been doing. You can't, when you set up a charity, it has to have a specific tax-exempt purpose. You can't say you're going to be an archival records repository based in Little Rock, uh, focused on President Clinton's history, um, and then, without telling the IRS, run around the world claiming that you're fighting HIV-AIDS uh, without getting preclearance from the IRS, something they did not do. All, you, you can't file these forms with the IRS, and if you're soliciting outside your state, home state, which is Arkansas, you've got to file... Every state's different in the U.S., but you've got to file, uh, file register at register in states. In states. You've got to make sure you do that stuff properly, and they didn't do that properly. And so what we found, and we're releasing quite a uh, – we released one tentative report, what we call the uh, first foundation report, where the, the title of it was uh, False Philanthropy Question Mark. And um, we laid out – that's on my website, www.charlesortel1l.com get it for free. I've written a bunch of articles for Breitbart, done a bunch of interviews since then as we dug into the detail. And starting next week, the 7th of uh, September, uh, on a daily basis, we will be serializing the second report. Uh, but uh, it's well along and it's in final production and editing now. And I can tell you, it is a global fraud. They have raised $2 billion on false pretenses, uh, in number, the bulk of their donors are small donors, but in they've defrauded uh, numerous governments around the world, uh, big governments, the UK, Australia. Uh, they have operated fraudulently in places like China and India. Uh, they've operated in more than 75 countries fraudulently on the basis of false filings. Um, and they announced in April after, not because of me, but, you know, nine days after our report on April 29th or 6th or in there, uh, the acting CEO, 
stated publicly that their filings were wrong. And they tried to hold them out as being, you know, technical infractions and, you know, we're going to get around to correct them. They said they might have to correct up to 12 years of filings, and they haven't corrected them. You can't do that. And, you know, what gets me a bit exercised about this is that the side of the IRS that looks out at, uh, after foundations and charities was between January 2001 and May 2013, roughly, administered by Lois Lerner. So on the one hand, she and her group, it seems, decided to target and persecute conservatives who were trying to operate these type of 501c3 and related uh, political organizations. But on the other hand, if you're friendly with Lois Lerner and her team, it would appear that the IRS is not going to go after you, even though uh, what you're doing is flagrantly a violation of the law. We're not talking, you know, small problems. We're talking uh, massive diversions of funds. In one case, uh, in the period November 2006 to about December 2008, by our estimate, the Clintons have diverted and the people around them over $100 million at the time when she ran for president last time. In earlier, when they were finishing the campaign, uh, sorry, finishing the uh, campus in Little Rock in 2004, again, by our calculations, looking at their filings, which are error-ridden and wrong, uh, nonetheless, you come away with the conclusion that a, a more than $60 million was diverted in 2004. And there are, <clears throat> you know, the, when you look at it, instead of being a case study in how to run something properly, it's a case study in how you shouldn't run a foundation. And uh, so we'll be calling next week. Uh, we're going to mount a, a, a national and an international call for justice here. We want to see uh, donors being protected. Donors are not sophisticated enough. They hear Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton's golden words about you know, all the good it's doing. But when you look at the facts that are in the public domain, these, this is a fraud. Yeah, and if, if regular Main Street people had done what they'd done, they'd be in jail. That tells you uh, what kind of system we have uh, in the country in regard to uh, law and order. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll give you a simple case in point. Um, actually, the Federal Trade Commission, in, in company with a bunch of attorney generals, state attorney generals, just launched a lawsuit against a smaller foundation that had raised about $187 million, I think, from memory, uh, to, to, in theory, pursue t uh, cancer relief around the world. Sort of the same story. They said they were, with the money, going ahead and buying medicines and shipping them off to Africa and other places. And instead, in that case, it is alleged that what happened uh, was that these monies were just used by the family that operated these four related charities. And, you know, when you look at serious charities, as I have done, they're scrupulous. And, and what's really interesting is, and I think in the coming weeks, days and weeks, this is what will actually put an end to Hillary Clinton's candidacy. Um, the philanthropic world is left-leaning. And a lot of the people in it understand these rules. They're serious rules. They're, this isn't like nuanced questions. This is you cannot engage in the legal activity full stop as a foundation. You can't. And even if you did great work but you engaged in illegal activity, the rules are you get shut down. And if you get shut down and your license is revoked retroactively, there's a massive tax bill because the foundation had collected more in revenue than it spent on expenses. That gets taxed at corporate rates. Donations uh, that were made to the foundation over time get, uh, get you know, the tax benefit that private donors took. That gets taxed with penalties and interest. Then the trustees get sued. So if you want to remedy the inequality that uh, Hillary Clinton claims exists in this country, one very simple way to do that is to shut this foundation down and go after the trustees and, and administer the kind of justice that it deserves, which is rough, comprehensive, example-setting justice. Uh, yeah, and, and there's a lot of reports out there that they did uh, arm deals with foreign government as well, which they're not. Are not they're not allowed to do that as well. So um, very interesting uh, investigation that you did and a lot of insight and tells you how corrupt the Clinton family is and how they think they're above the law, uh, above everyone in in, in this country. And um, I hope she doesn't get in, into the office. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> well, as I say, you know, our effort in this one was really focused primarily on trying to understand how the rules apply 
to a global charity. And there's sort of a common thread in my work. You know, I think the system doesn't appropriately regulate multinational corporations seeking profit, and it certainly now does not appear to the American system to regulate multinational uh, charities. The other thing here I just would point out, this is not a domestic political issue alone. The Clintons have defrauded numerous foreign governments, uh, high-profile foreign governments, and as some of whom are not any more controlled by allies of the Clintons. So what we're hoping here is that people are really going to dig in, gonna force an internal investigation using the resources of state, federal, and foreign governments. We're going to get to the bottom of this, figure out what really happened, figure out who, do, who needs to get punished and, and how. And then out of all this, maybe we'll have a template to how to run these type of presidential foundations uh, and other large fa- foundations so that donors can have a high degree of confidence that their monies are being used for their intended purposes. And I, I agree with you. Michelle, thank you for your time. If people want to find out more about what you do and where they can find about your investigation on the Clinton Foundation, where can they go? Uh, the, the couple, three places, really. Uh, my own website, www.charlesortel.com, one word. Um, then I'm on Twitter, at, at Charles Ortel. And I'm on Facebook, at Charles K. Ortel. And those are probably the three simplest ways. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Charles, and hopefully you can come back on again soon. Anytime. Have a great one.